Okay, uh, let's get started. Welcome back after the Thanksgiving break. And uh, um, sorry for a little bit of delay in starting this class. So today, uh, I'm going to continue the discussion about approximate dynamic programming. So if you recall, in the previous class, we were discussing um, how do you do the, how do you implement dynamic programming in a computer? And one of the things we discussed was you discretize the state space and you compute the value function. And then when you have to do the optimization at a, at, at a time t, then you do linear interpolation for the future value function and that's how you uh, do the optimization. So today we, I want to take that idea about approximating the value function using discrete set of points and I want to push it further and I want to talk about what is this whole area of approximate dynamic programming and why is it so important uh, for many, many applications. So to give you, uh, to, so, so let's put the entire idea of dynamic programming in context. So what are the typical ingredients in dynamic programming equation? So the first is the state space xt, which is Rn. And here you can have R2, you can have R10, you can have R200, or you can have R34 or 35,000. So if you are working in Center for Automotive Research, these are the typical state spaces that you will be working with. In my group, we work with this kind of state space, R200. Uh, I recently met a faculty in mechanical engineering, uh, Professor David Holzile, and uh, his research group is working on dynamic programming with R35,000, so their state space is pretty large. Uh, this kind of state space appears in additive manufacturing where they need to figure out how to move the laser beam in order to manufacture 3D products. The second ingredient is the action space and this could be again very similar R2, R10, R100 and I don't know R1000. You could have, of course, much higher dimensional action spaces as well. And again, if you're working in automotive applications, these are the typical action spaces you will see. Uh, in our research, we usually work with action spaces that are 100 dimensional or more, somewhere in that vicinity. The additive manufacturing example where the state space is R35,000, the action space is actually R4. So it's not really a very high dimensional action space, but the state space is very high dimensional. Then we had the time horizon T. This is the horizon length. And this could be 2, 5, 50, or 48. So uh, every half an hour for an entire day, or it could be 10,000. Or it could even be 10 raised to 9. Okay, so in wireless system, the horizon length would be 10 raised to 9. And the reason is, within a matter of a few seconds, the number of uh, switching actions that the Wi-Fi routers take, they are of the order of millions or billions. Right? So in those cases, you know, the, uh, the time horizon of 1 billion is equal to one second in our day-to-day -day life. So it's really a, a very large time horizon that they deal with. <clears throat> Anything else? We have the FT, which is the state transition function. And of course, we have talked about linear and nonlinear. state transition functions. Uh, or maybe we never talked about linear and nonlinear systems, but you can imagine FT could be linear or FT could be nonlinear in the state and action. And then we have the cost function CT, and it could be again linear, it could be quadratic, it could be convex, or it could be non-convex. <coughs> 
and then we have the constraints gt and ht these are the constraints and you could have similar structure here as well anything else that i'm missing in terms of dynamic programming no i think that's all there is so in theory dynamic programming works for all these different combinations that you can make so you could have r35000 action space r2 time horizon 48 state transition function could be non linear cost function could be convex gt and ht could be some sort of non convex constraints doesn't matter you know the theory is is very very general and it will work on those problems but the issue is many a times we would like to execute the entire dynamic programming computation within a few seconds or milliseconds or microseconds or nanoseconds uh, and the question is how do you do that how do you so as we have seen dynamic programming is actually a very complicated set of optimization a sequence of optimization problems that you need to solve and it seems unlikely that we could solve any kind of dynamic programming algorithm in a reasonable amount of time on a reasonable hardware device so because of that we need to always come up with approximation schemes for dynamic programs and at this point of time there are like millions of papers written on it millions of books written on it and uh, you have problems like this appearing in supply chain appearing in aircraft staff management air, sorry airline staff management uh, they appear in uh, just taxing of aircraft so which aircraft should go first depending on what preference and when should the aircraft be pushed back from gate and so on and so forth uh, so no matter which area of life you look at there is a dynamic programming there is a so there is a simple policy you can have a simple policy gamma that maps x to u you can pick a simple policy and you can just execute that policy but that policy is not optimal right and you have certain cost functions and you know what the state transition function is you have certain constraints and then the question is okay fine we are using currently some policy but i'm sure i can solve this optimization problem and come up with a better policy that is going to optimize the cost and so no matter which area of life you look at uh, there is a slow and steady infiltration of dynamic programming ideas in each of those areas uh, so to give you an example uh, we recently completed a project uh, funded by department of energy for reducing the energy consumption of autonomous vehicles by 20 25% and we were able to achieve that with a combination of different technology but one of the crucial technology was dynamic programming algorithm where we came up with a different way of running the dynamic programming algorithm on a vehicle and a vehicle is a real time system safety critical system uh, the execution time has to be the, we had a requirement a hard requirement that the execution time for our dynamic programming algorithm must be 100 milliseconds and so every 100 milliseconds we will refresh we'll update the information coming from the sensors uh, we'll update the cost function the constraints and the state transition function based on the information we have received uh, we had certain time horizon 5 10 those were the time horizon we were looking at and we needed to execute the entire dynamic programming algorithm in a matter of 100 milliseconds so it was a very very difficult requirement and uh, you know we came up with an approximate dynamic programming algorithm to do that so that is just an autonomous vehicle fuel consumption example now the second phase of project has started where the students and uh, and uh, other collaborators they are working on optimizing not just the energy consumption of the vehicle's longitudinal motion but also the hvac system and other auxiliary loads that are on the vehicle uh, 
So now the problem is much higher dimensional. So earlier we were looking at two state, two action problem, uh, which we completed. Now we are looking at a 10 state and maybe like four or five action problem. And the constraints are the same. We need to run that algorithm in 100 milliseconds. Okay, so I don't know how we will do it, which is why it's a research project. Uh, we don't know how we will do it. We don't know whether we'll be successful or not, but we are working towards meeting that requirement by both upgrading the computational hardware on board, but also by trying to figure out how do we execute the dynamic program in a much more uh, sophisticated way so as to meet that 100 milliseconds requirement for the execution time. Okay. Any questions so far on this motivation of why we study dynamic, approximate dynamic programming? Okay. So now let's consider the following problem. So I have, I have given you some problem uh, where there is some state. By the way, one thing that I forgot to mention, I have written R here, but you might as well have n raised to 5 n raised to 100 and so on. And the same thing here, you could have a state space that is just a natural number, not a real number. So you could have all sorts of different uh, uh, descriptions of the state space and the action space. Now here is the question for you. So I give you a dynamic programming algorithm, uh, sorry, I give you a dynamic optimization uh, problem and I give you the requirement that on this hardware, it has to take 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds or 10 seconds. Uh, you, you, you should be able to compute your entire solution within that hard time constraint. What would your first set of uh, thoughts would be? Like what would you like to start with? What do you think? What would you like to start with? So I gave you some optimization algorithm some things that you already know, uh, if you had a linear state transition function and a quadratic cost function with no constraint, you can solve it very easily. You can solve it by hand and that's your assignment problem. So you know from your past experience that some dynamic programmings are, uh, programming algorithms are very easy to execute because you can solve it by hand and it's just a matrix manipulation which can be done very quickly. Um, now, of course, if I just added some constraints on your linear quadratic problem, the one that you have already been working on, the problem becomes very, very complicated and you won't be able to solve it in a reasonable amount of time <coughs> on an embedded hardware. So, so we know from our experience, some problems are easy to solve, some problems are difficult to solve. Now, with this background, what do you think your initial reaction is going to be? What do you think you would want to do given an optimization problem or given a dynamic optimization problem and given a time constraint and a hardware on which it needs to run? What would your uh, first things to try would be? Yeah. Try to transform the problem into the easier one. Okay. So you want to do model approximation. So you have a highly nonlinear model, highly nonlinear cost function, you have some complicated constraints, and you transform, you're trying to transform that problem into an easier state transition function. Perhaps you have some equilibrium path and you linearize the entire nonlinear system around that equilibrium path. And then you have a complicated cost function and you create a quadratic cost function by using a Taylor expansion. And then you have some complicated constraints, but you try to come up with an inner approximation or an outer approximation of those constraints and uh, you convert them into a set of linear constraints or a set of, uh, sorry, a set of linear inequality constraints. So now the problem becomes much easier to handle on the computational uh, system that you have. And that kind of idea is frequently invoked in power systems. So. Uh, if you want to optimize how the grid functions, uh, then you have to use model approximation because the actual model is highly nonlinear, highly dif like difficult to even specify 
So you always have to resort to some sort of model approximation to get any reasonable solutions. OK, so good. So, the, so there is option one is to do the model approximation. Now suppose the model is simple. OK, it's a linear state transition function, a quadratic cost function, but now you have like a bunch of constraints. What would you do now? And I want you to remember what we did in the previous class. What, what we had a problem that we wanted to run on a computer. What exactly did we do in that particular problem? Invoke duality. So that basically is an, so duality is used only when you want to solve the one stage optimization problem. But what's the general methodology that we tried to develop in the previous class? Anyone wants to try and sort of conceptualize what exactly did we do in the previous class? So we did approximation of value function. Okay, so in the previous class, the way we approximated the value function, we just assumed that it's a, it's a linear uh, interpolation of a bunch of points. <coughs> so that is approximation of the value functions. And the third, which is uh, very similar to the second one, is approximation of policy. Approximation in policy space. So we have this uh, gamma mapping from x to t u. And I'm just going to make an approximation that my u has to be a linear function of x, OK? So that's an approximation in the policy space. <coughs> so for those of you who took 3551, this is what we were doing in 3551. We restricted ourselves to PID controllers or lead lag controllers in 3551, which is the feedback control systems class. So we had a nonlinear system. <coughs> Sorry. So we had a nonlinear system. We linearized it around the equilibrium trajectory. So we got a linear system model. Then we converted it into a transfer function. And then we developed a linear controller, a PID controller, or a lead lag controller, which are all linear controllers. And so our policies were restricted to linear policies. And of course, in 3551, all we cared about was stability. But of course, now we don't just care about stability. We care about minimizing a cost. So uh, things are a bit more complicated in this class in comparison to the case in 3551 or whatever feedback controls class you may have taken. OK? And then, of course, the fourth part, which is uh, I have done the model approximation. I have approximated the value function. I have approximated the policy functions. Now, the fourth one is to. Uh, is to <coughs> intelligently uh, transform the problem so as to uh, deal with this horizon length. So if your horizon length is 10,000, you can't really. So let me give you a concrete example. If I want to go from here to Dublin, that's probably like 20 miles of driving. Uh, if I want to optimize every 10 meters, I probably have, I don't know, maybe 5,000 uh, horizon length. I can't be running an optimization with 5,000 horizon length every, 500, every 100 milliseconds. It's just infeasible to do, to do that. <coughs> so what we have to do is approximate uh, the the entire dynamic programming algorithm by doing something with the horizon, okay? So 
let me say approximations with horizons, but that's not really a technical term. I'm just using it in this class. OK? This is not really a technique. These are the technical terms. This one is not a technical term, but I'm just using it in the class to explain myself better. <coughs> Any questions so far? OK. I think the model approximation is fairly clear. Uh, I'm not going to go into model approximation. This is extremely specific to that particular system. So in the case of the autonomous vehicle problem that we worked on, uh, we just assume that a vehicle is a point mass system. That's a model approximation. Uh, the other type of approximation that people can do for a vehicle is a, it's a bicycle model, okay? So that's a, another kind of model approximation. So we assume point mass, some people assume a bicycle model, and some people will assume the usual vehicular model, which is far more complicated. So our model approximation was point mass, but that's because it's a vehicle that's going on the road. We don't really care about the steering angle and stuff. We just care about the longitudinal motion. So, uh, so point mass was a good enough model approximation for a vehicle. Um, but so it's very, very context specific. Okay, so therefore, uh, I'm not going to talk much about model approximation. The only general methodology in model approximation is uh, you have a nonlinear state transition function. You have some trajectory that you want to follow. So you linearize the state transition function using Taylor series approximation. And so you will have a linear model for, a non, for your original nonlinear system. You will have a linear model. And that kind of stuff is used in aircrafts and rockets. So as, you, as aircraft moves in the air, it will have some approximate linear model for the aircraft. And then it does optimal uh, control strategy on the basis of that linear model approximation. <coughs> so model approximation is fairly straightforward and very, very context specific. So we won't really talk about that as much. So approximations in value functions and approximation in policy space. <clears throat> so we have the value function Vt of xt equals to min of ct xt ut plus Vt plus 1 ft xt ut. And this is minimization over ut in Rm. And I have g of xt ut gt and ht of xt ut equals to 0. <coughs> and then I have gamma t of xt equals to the argument of the same thing. How many of you are ECE students, like who have done ECE undergrad? <coughs> Only two people? OK. You also did ECE e undergrad? OK. <coughs> Sorry. For some reason, it's very dry today. I don't know why. Uh, OK. 
So in the previous class, we said that, okay, fine, my, I'm going to discretize my state space xt, and I'm going to compute the value function at, that, at those particular states, and then when I'm going one step back in the dynamic programming, so I've computed vt plus one at discrete points in the state space, and then at this point of time, when I'm trying to solve this minimization problem, I'm going to do linear interpolation of vt. Okay. Now let's think of it more generally. So I have a bunch of points, x, t, k, and I have computed v, t of x, t, k. k equals 1 to, I don't know, 1,000. So I've picked some 1,000 points in the state space and I've computed the value function at those 1,000 points. Which field of science and mathematics studies coming up with a function f, oh, f is already used, g is used, h is used, what should be a function? Uh, beta, have we used beta? No, we have not. Okay. So my question is, what field studies identifying a mapping xt to r based on this data that you have? This is the input data, this is the output data for this function beta. OK, I don't want to use beta. Let me use v hat, v hat t. Regression. <coughs> so regression tries to come up with a function that approximates an input-output behavior. Okay, that's the general field is called regression. It's a field in statistics and nowadays it's heavily used in a lot of machine learning and approximate dynamic programming literature reinforcement learning literature. Okay, so we, we, we compute for uh, some randomly picked, not randomly, some uh, states that I have picked within the state space, I compute the value function, and then I use regression to come up with a function v hat t, which maps x t to r. And the same thing can be said for gamma hat t as well. Gamma hat t that maps x t to the action set ut. Okay, so we have this data set and then we have xtk and then let me call gamma t gamma t star xtk k equals 1 to 1000. And so once you are given these data sets you can do regression to either try and approximate the value function or try and approximate the policy function. <coughs> so, the, so how do you do regression? So this is the typical method. So you define a function class. Let me denote it by V of theta. So theta is the parameter, theta is in Rn, no, I shouldn't say, um, this should be capital theta. <coughs> so theta is the parameter set, N, M is already used, R, K. No, K is also used, uh, R, L. Okay, so what this function class does, every function here 
v theta is a function from x t or x to r and theta is of course a parameter uh, a vector in uh, l dimensional euclidean space and every function in the function class is parameterized by theta and it takes as input a function x and it gives an output uh, in uh, on the real li real axis r <coughs> Okay, so you define you define a function class, and then after that, you try to find theta star, which is argmin over theta in R L or theta in capital theta v theta x t k minus v t. X T K square summation K equals one to one thousand. I'm going to go over a few function classes very shortly. <clears throat> and I'm going to connect it to signals and systems class that is a prerequisite for this class so I'm assuming some of you may have taken it before okay so once you get let me call it theta t theta star t so once you get theta star t then you replace v hat t equals to v of theta t, theta star t. So that becomes your approximate value function. And then you, you can continue doing this uh, approximation all the way up to time t equals to 1. So you start at terminal time capital T plus 1. And then you keep doing this approximation at every point of time all the way until you, re you reach time t equals to 1. Okay, so linear interpolation was uh, an example of this parameterized function class where the parameters are basically the coefficients of different, uh, uh, different points in the value function. Okay, let's look at a few very, very uh, important function classes. So one is linear class. So V theta of X equals to summation theta I alpha I X I equals one to capital N. So I pick basis functions And then I take linear combination of the basis functions and I get my V of theta. <clears throat> what is the connection of this to signals and systems? Did we have basis functions in signals and systems? So if you all remember, complex exponentials were basis functions in signals and systems class. So this, <coughs> so in signals and systems, what was different? This function was a function of time, t, not x, or in some sense, x was one dimensional in that particular class. This alpha i of t 
was e raised to j omega i t. Okay, so omega i was the frequency, j is like the complex number square root of minus 1 and t was the time which was what we were trying to approximate. Okay, and so in that class if you had a function f of t you wrote it as summation of theta i e raised to j omega i t i goes from 1 to n, right? This was your Fourier series representation of a periodic function. So if ft was periodic, you can write it in this particular way. This is known as Fourier series. So actually this linear function class is something that you have already seen. In fact, the entire course of signals and systems is based on the fact that a periodic function can be decomposed into certain number of uh, complex exponential functions, uh, periodic functions, right? And this theta i would be the weight of those frequencies in the signal ft, okay? So this was a signal and this was a Fourier series decomposition of the signal and you had uh, a, a non-periodic uh, signal and then you had a Fourier um, integral representation of that particular signal. So in some sense you have already seen this linear function class in your, in your signals and systems class through the Fourier series representation uh, that, that you all have, may have studied in your signals and systems class. So I'm going to erase this part. <coughs> and I just want to close this particular uh, linear class of function discussion by saying that this basis function is actually very difficult to pick in uh, generic applications. So if I give you an, an optimization problem today, you probably won't be able to find what an appropriate basis function looks like. But you know, of course, if you go in a field where people are using dynamic programming for 10 years or 15 years, they probably have figured out through trial and error which basis functions work well for that particular problem and which don't. Um, so again, something that you want to, uh, you want to keep in mind when you, uh, uh, when you go into, into the field and when you start working on dynamic optimization problems because it's not clear a priori which basis functions would work well. If you recall the discussion on resource allocation problem, the basis function there was a logarithmic function, log of x, and then there was a constant term. So again, uh, going back to our resource allocation example, the best base basis function there would be alpha 1 of x equals to log of x, alpha 2 of x equals to 1. Okay, so if you pick these two as basis function, alpha 1x equals to log x and alpha 2x equals to 1, you can actually write the value function exactly. Okay, because you chose the right basis function for that particular problem. <coughs> okay, now what happens if instead of now let's say I didn't tell you what the solution to the resource allocation problem was. In which case, <coughs> if I forced you to pick a basis function, you probably would have picked the basis function as alpha 1 x equals to say 1, <coughs> alpha 2 x equals to x, alpha 3 x equals to x square and so on, right? So you could have picked a lot of different polynomials or, or higher order terms of x and you could have used that as the basis function for, for uh, solving the resource allocation problem. In which case you will always be computing an approximate value function, you will never be able to compute the exact value function, right? So as you can see choice of basis function is very important um, and if you pick an appropriate basis function, you can actually write your value function exactly. On the other hand, if you pick a bad basis function, you will never be able to uh, write the, uh, the value function exactly. Uh, another uh, class of 
basis function is let me write it down again any question on this one <coughs> So this was the resource allocation. Now let's look at LQR. Can someone tell me what the V theta of X in LQR, like what would be an appropriate choice of basis function in that? So if you recall, it was X transpose theta X, where theta is the positive definite matrix. So you could as well write it as summation of theta IJ, XI, XJ ij goes from 1 to n. <clears throat> so in that case, the basis function was, uh, was xi xj. That's it. Okay, so in LQR, this theta was actually a positive definite matrix, and I can call this as my basis function alpha ij of x. And then it's a linear basis function of, uh, <coughs> it's a linear class. The value function is in the linear class with respect to these basis functions. Okay, so we saw several examples of where linear basis functions are important. Um, and, but the more, the more complicated thing here is to recognize what that basis function is going to look like. Any question? No? Then the second is kernel method. <coughs> so V theta of X is summation I equals one to N theta I of K X X I. Where K is some sort of kernel. and so on. These are known as kernels. Just, just kernels. So you can pick kernels k, some, some sort of kernel. There are very, very, there are many examples of kernels. Um, these, these, the theory is studied under the umbrella of reproducing kernel Hilbert space, uh, which is sort of beyond the scope of this class. But one of the simple ways by which you can uh, extend the theory of reproducing kernel Hilbert space to the setting that we have in this particular problem is you pick xi, uh, randomly from the state space and then you put theta i and the, the, the basis function is automatically picked as k of x comma xi. So alpha i of x is x essentially k of x comma xi. Okay, where xi's are picked either randomly or you have, you, you, you come up with some good heuristic of identifying important states in the state space um, and then you use a kernel function to extend the value function across the entire state space. So this is again another function class, V of theta of X. <coughs> 
any questions on this particular method no okay third important class is neural networks so v theta of x is summation theta summation what should i do so theta has two components so theta 1 i sigma theta 2 i transpose x i equals 1 to n where sigma is some sort of non linear function sigma is non linear non polynomial <clears throat> so theta 2i is a vector and theta 1i is a scalar and then you um take some composition of function take a linear combination and that's a neural network okay How many of you are familiar with neural networks or have trained neural networks before? One, two, okay. So few people have trained neural networks before. This is in the last ten or so years. This particular approach has become extremely uh, useful and widespread. And the good thing here for with neural networks, the good thing is, of course, this is a single layer neural network. This is what is known as single layer neural network. but you could have multiple layers so you could i could add sigma 1 sigma 2 and then add another sigma 3 and sigma 4 and so on so i can make the depth that is known as the depth of the neural network so i can make as many depth as as i want i could make the width very large so my n is the width of the neural network so i can make the width very large and i could make very complicated neural networks to store the value function Okay, so that's something that I'm not going to talk about in the class. Uh, there is an assignment question where you are asked to come up with an algorithm to train neural network, which is how do you solve this problem when v theta is a neural network? So that's something I'm assuming you all have looked into and you are solving it. So uh, this is fairly. Uh, uh i i wouldn't say well studied but in implementation this has done really very good things so widely ex accepted at this point of time that this is a very superior method for a variety of applications the only problem with this sort of uh, neural network based value function or policy function approximation is uh, the non explainability so if if something happens in the on the ground there is no way for you to backtrack and figure out where exactly did the algorithm go wrong because neural networks cannot be explained like the actions taken by neural network cannot be explained because it's a combination of multiple weights with certain non linearity that you have picked as your activation function sigma so it's 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 very difficult to do any troubleshooting if things go wrong with neural network and then there are decision trees which basically uh oh sorry i shouldn't say de decision tree regression tree which basically would say something like x1 greater than 5 x2 less than 5 then the value v of theta of x is equal to 0.25 x2 greater than 
then v theta of x equals to 0 0.5 and this is for x1 greater than 5 and then this is true and if this is not true false then you can have a similar tree structure and that's a that's a regression that's called a regression tree <clears throat> and that's another way to store a value function the problem with this sort of regression tree is that the value functions are discontinuous at uh, certain points in the state space and this that discontinuity can hurt if you're using gradient based approaches for solving dynamic program but it will not hurt if you're not using a gradient based approach for executing the dynamic program okay so these are various uh, function approximation sorry uh, function approximating classes that people have used in dynamic programming uh, this is for value function you can do the same thing for policy functions as well <coughs> and uh, in the next class i'll talk about how does the approximation of the horizon length uh, affect different algorithms like what kind of algorithms can you come up with uh, with respect to approximations of horizon length so let's talk about that in the next class uh, we are already over with respect to time so see you on wednesday